looking at the life of David, and um, we are uh, now moving into 2 Samuel. We've gone through 1 Samuel, and um, we're looking really at the, the, the general theme of our message is David, a man after God's own heart. And uh, we've said that you know, God is after hearts. God is, uh, was after David's heart, uh, but even before David had a heart for God. And God has a heart for you more even before you had a heart for him. So everything that God does is, is really centered around your heart. It's not so much just the external things that we do. It's what go, is going on on the inside that really counts. And, uh, you know, I was just at a, a, um, a graduation uh, this week on Friday. Um, this last month I was involved in something called the Joshua Program uh, out in Cavan. And there was a number of young people, or young and old, that really had, were long-term unemployed, hadn't worked in a month of Sundays, and um, they were uh, struggling uh, to find work, struggles around addiction, struggles around self-esteem, all kinds of issues. And in essence, everything that the world had offered them had failed. Every program that had been offered to them, they hadn't succeeded. But this was different. This program was not only a, a practical employment program, but it was actually designed to bring faith into the equation. And so uh, I was there helping out in that, that aspect of it, doing the, the fresh start. And what we saw was absolutely amazing. God beginning to work in these 16, 17 uh, different candidates that went through that program. And every one of them were testifying about the work that God had done in them. And uh, it had been a, a remarkable work. And, uh, you know, what I, I commented on was that, you know, as at many times there are those external things that people do, but it's really the internal work of God that really makes the difference. And every one of them were there, addictions broken, uh, hope restored, many of them now motivated to actually gain, gain employment. And it was just, I, I just sat there, I was just in tears, just as I was watching the handiwork and fingerprints of God on lives. Amen? And that's what it's all about. Praise God. So with that as a backdrop, we're going to pray and we're going to get into the word. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you. Lord, your word is true. Lord, my God, you, Lord, change lives. Lord, my God, this isn't merely just a, a meeting where we're listening to some, some talk, oh God. This is your word. And Lord, my God, today, Lord, we want to be open to your word. We want, Holy Spirit, that you would open our minds and open our ears and hearts, oh God, that you might do something within us, Lord, my God, that will change us and shift us and deepen, Lord, our walk with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's look here. 2 Samuel chapter 3, and verse, starting at verse 1. He says, And there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew, grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. In verse 2, The sons who were born to David at Hebron, his firstborn was Ammon of Ammonil, or sorry, of Anamon of Jezreel. And the second was uh, Chiliab uh, of, Gab, uh, of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And the third was Absalom, the son of Makkah, uh, the daughter of Tamai, uh, king of Geshur. The fourth was Adonijah, uh, the son of Hathcath. Uh, the sixth was uh, Shepatiah, the son of Abitel. The sixth was uh, Ithrium, the of Egal, uh, Egla, rather, David's wife. These were born in Hebron. And while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Achaia. And Ishaboth Ish Ish said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? And Abner was very angry over the words that Ishaboth had said. 
He says, am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day I show steadfast love to the house of Saul your father and to his brothers and to his friends and have not given, in, uh, given you into the hand of David. And yet you charge me today with fault concerning a woman. God do so to Abner and also more if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. And Ishaboth could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf saying, To whom does the land belong? Make a covenant with me and behold my hand will be with you to bring over Israel, all of Israel to you. And he said, Good, I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, that is, you not, shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, uh, to, uh, when you come to see my face. And David sent messengers to Ishaboth, and Saul's son, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, my wife Michael, for whom I paid a bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishaboth sent and took her from her husband, uh, Patiel, the son of Lash. Uh, Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after all the way up to Barun. And Abner said to him, Go return. And he returned. And Abner conferred with all the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past you've been seeking David as king over you. Now then bring it about. For the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David will I save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of the, all their enemies. Abner spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David that all at Hebron, that all Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. When Abner came with 20 men to, David's, at, to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and his men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and gather all of Israel to my lord the king, that they may have, make a covenant with you, and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Now just then, the servants of David arrived with Joab from a raid, bringing in much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David at Hebron, for he had been sent away and had gone in peace. When Joab and the army that was with him came, and it was told to Joab, Abner's son, the son of Nero, came to the king, and he has sent him, and he's let him go, and he's gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, "What have you done?" Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you've sent him away and he, so he is gone? You know that Abner, son of Ner, came to deceive you. And you know, and to know you're going out and you're coming in, and to know all that you're doing. When Joab came out of David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner and brought him back to the cistern of Sarah. But David did not know about it. And when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the midst of the gate to speak to him privately. And there he struck him in the stomach, so he died from the blood of Ashiel, his brother. Afterwards, David heard about it. And he said, My kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner, the son of Nair. May it fall on the head of Joab and upon his father's house. And may the house of Joab never be without one who has discharge or one who is leprous or holds a spindle or falls by the sword or lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because they, he had put their brother Ashiel to death at the battle of Gibeon. David said to Joab and all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and mourn for Abner. And uh, King David followed the bier. Uh, they buried Abner at Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner, saying, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet were not fettered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. And all the people wept again over him. Then all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while, he was yet, while it was yet day. But David swore, God so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything until, unless the sun goes down. And all the people took notice of it and it pleased them. As everything the, the king did please all the people. So all the people of Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's will to put to death Abner the son of Nair. And the king said to his servants, uh, Do you not know that the 
that a prince, a great man, has fallen in Israel today. I was gentle today, though anointed king. Uh, these men, the sons of Zeruah, are more severe than I. The Lord repaid the evildoer according to his wickedness. Hallelujah. May God bless to us his word this morning. So, as I were looking at the life of David, and it's been roughly about 10 years from the time that David was first plucked out of obscurity as a young boy minding his father's sheep when the prophet Samuel came looking for the next king of Israel. And uh, you'll remember the, the story where he lined up Jesse's sons and the strapping, uh, robust uh, young men uh, who in the natural would appear to be perfect candidates. And yet every time they came to one of them, the Spirit of the Lord said to Samuel, no, it's not this one. It's not this one. And they ended up, he says, you know, have you got, not yet got another son? And of course, they, Jesse replies, well, there is one, but he's minding the sheep. He's uh, a young, goofy, uh, teenage boy. And, uh, you know, he was, it was so insignificant that he didn't, wasn't even invited to this, uh, this suspicious occasion. And so he got anointed. And from that time on, we see that the, this phrase follows David. And it is, the Spirit of the Lord was with David, or God was with David. And so David ends up uh, defeating Goliath, uh, demonstrating a young, probably 13, 10 to 13 year old lad, defeating the giant Goliath. And, um, you know, that was a, a, a tremendous, stunning feat of courage and faith. And what it does is it, it puts J David in a position where he is you know, taken from Bethlehem and then he's fast-tracked, if you like, uh, and uh, he enters the service of King Saul uh, in a very much a hothouse environment, uh, right in the very center of the, the, the political uh, capital of Israel at that time, Gibeah. And so he enters a season of uh, really just working in the king, working for King Saul. And uh, there we find his conduct is, uh, is good, uh, his attitude is good. Uh, and again, the blessing of God is very obvious and very evident upon him. The favor of God is upon him. But we find that Saul, who is really the picture of a carnal Christian, is insecure and threatened by this young teenage boy. He knows that his days are numbered, and he knows that God's hands upon David, and he knows that this young man is the likely ruler of Israel. People even make up a song about him. They say, they sing, you know, and this, is, this, this tune seems to follow David. It's, the tune is, is, you know, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. And so from that time forward, we find that, um, that you know, David falls out of favor with Saul, and Saul begins to uh, conspire to kill David. And so it gets so hot uh, in, uh, in Gibeah that uh, David's life comes under threat and so finally comes to a head and he, he, he leaves. He has to run for his life. And so for now for a, a five to seven year period he's living life as a fugitive going from cave to cave fleeing the armies of Saul and God is rescuing him uh, from the hands of Saul. And um, but in this time, in this wilderness time, we see that, you know, for David, it's a mixed bag uh, in relation just to his life spiritually and also his, his character development. And again, I want to say that, you know, God had a plan for David. When David was in Bethlehem, when he was in Gibeah, uh, you know, in some ways, you know, he was protected. He was cushioned from a lot of life's pressure. But when he found himself in the wilderness, running for his life, living hand to, day, hand to mouth and day to day and fleeing from the armies of Saul, he was living a life of pressure and stress. And pressure and stress really you know, exposed some things about himself, about his character. We find that David has a propensity to be, uh, to lie. So basically, uh, you know, in, in different situations, he will not be completely honest. 
Uh, he's um, economical with the truth. He can cheat. He can scheme. But we also see and have seen that in certain situations, you know, he is he's acting with uh, grace, with honor, with mercy, particularly where it comes to authority. There were times where, you know, he had the opportunity to, to kill Saul, to touch the Lord's anointed, to take matters into his own hands, to act presumptuously. But we find that in those situations, on two occasions, David does not do that because he realizes there is a future destiny ahead of me. And if I allow myself to indulge in doing this thing, that's going to come back to bite me. And so while he's there, there's, there's aspects of his character and life which, as I said, are, are not pleasing to God, there's other things that we see that he is getting a, an A plus in, as it were. And um, one of the things that he's learning is, uh, particularly through this time, is the idea that, you know, God is the initiator. God is the one who starts things. It's not we presumptuously taking matters into our own hands and then asking God to bless us afterwards. And so we find that David learns the lesson uh, of you know, seeking the Lord first before he makes any major decisions in life. And so we find that now uh, in the, the chapter we just, just read and leading into this, this season, we find that Saul is now dead. Uh, he's died, uh, the kingdom is in disarray, and he now moves from the season in, in Bethlehem, Gibeah, and then the wilderness, and now he's moving into a season which we call Hebron. He moves to the city of Hebron, the city where uh, Abraham and Sarah were buried. Abraham had bought that from the Hittite. And a very significant place in Israel's history. And there he is anointed king over Judah. Only one twelfth of the promise that God had for him. And so David would have been the natural leader. The, the, the obvious choice once Saul had died. Everybody, he'd be the name on everybody's lips. And yet... They pass him by. They overlook him. And so Abner, who is the, we're going to find a little bit of uh, talk about today. Abner is the, this robust um, he-man. He's a, a military man, uh, no-nonsense individual. He's been the captain of Saul's armies. And he is the, the, the strong man in Israel. And so in a political move, uh, Abner basically uh, appoints Ishaboth. Ishaboth is one of Saul's sons. He's probably a, uh, a minor. Uh, his name means weak. His name means sickly. And so weak and sickly. Can you imagine calling your son weak and sickly? <laughs> weak and sickly is put on the throne of Israel. And so David has to stand by and, and look and see... Here is somebody less competent, less qualified than me. I've been overlooked for promotion. And so he, Ishaboth is, 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 is on the throne, and Abner is the real power behind the throne. Ishaboth is really just a, a puppet. And uh, as I said, uh, so David only has a partial part of the promise, amen? Uh, he's only got one twelfth of what he'd been promised. And so what this speaks of is really is a, it's a season of transition. And so in this seven-year period in Hebron, David is going to, his trust in God is tested. He has to learn about the timings of God. Again, his attitude, the tone, his temperament is tested. All these things are tested. And in a sense, David learns the importance of waiting on God. And allowing God to be the one who opens the doors. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 it says. And we know for those that love God all things work together for good. Those who are called according to his purposes. And then uh, Jeremiah 29 he says I know the plans I have for you. Declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Hallelujah. 
So we find here in Hebron, the episodes of David's life demonstrate four steps God is taking with him. When, he, when it should have been a foregone conclusion, when it should have been easy, suddenly it becomes a little bit more complicated, a little harder. And God does four things. First, he teaches God, that, that God vindicates slowly. Okay? He doesn't just you know, give you things straight away. He blesses him openly. He surprises him occasionally. But he tests him continually. See, David is in the training camp of life. He is being trained to reign. He's been trained to be a king. And there are certain things God has to work out in his life, hallelujah, before he's ready. Praise God. So as the chapter opens, we find again there's conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David. It says there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. David grew stronger and stronger, but the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. Hallelujah. So we find that as, I said, the, as, as he submits to God's dealings in his life, that uh, uh, you know, the favor of God is upon him. David's not, uh, he's just getting stronger and stronger. He's learning and uh, accruing more and more uh, influence and power and strength. And then we have this, in the next few verses, we've got this little parenthetical passage. It's almost like a, a oh, by the way. Uh, you know, it's like the war's going on, but just let's, let's, let's pause there for a minute, and I want to tell you something. So the writer tells us here that there were sons born to David in Hebron. It says the firstborn was Amon, son of Ammonin. These, these names are, are, are <laughs> very difficult. Uh, the second was Chiliab. Uh, the third was Absalom. And then we've got Adonijah, Sepiai, Ethrian. And these are the, the ones born to David. And, and so what we see here is, is interesting. David again is going to rue the day that he, he indulged in this, uh, in this activity. Because what he's doing in some ways, he's going against the commands of the Lord himself uh, in relation to kingship. Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 17, talking about the kings of Israel, he says, He shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive gold. See, again, God is interested in the heart of the king. He's saying, do not acquire many wives, lest your heart turn away. Don't acquire for yourself excessive silver and gold. You see, there are certain things that uh, afflict leaders more than you know, other people. And, um, you know, I like to call it the gals, the glory, and the gold. And every leader needs to protect himself from, from the allure of, of gals, glory, and gold. And uh, David was no different. Uh, he was tested in all these different areas. And again, it has to do with the, the purity, what's going on in the heart. And you see... In his culture, in his day, it was, it was common practice for kings and men of power to have many wives. It was one of the ways that they would um, express their power and their status. But this practice came with a price. And, uh, you know, for David, it would be heartache and headaches. I mean, it was bad. <laughs> one wife. <laughs> It's enough for any man. <laughs> One wife. <laughs> it's enough for any man. <laughs> now David, he, he takes six in this time. Now some of those admittedly would have been political maneuverings and things like that. But, but what we're going to find out, the, the Bible here just simply reports it very matter of fact. It doesn't make a comment on it. But what, as we look, as we read on, we see that, you know, what a man sows, he's going to reap. And what we find here, Amon, or Ammon, ended up raping his half-sister and was murdered by his half-brother. Chiliab dies young. Absalom murders his half-brother and leads a rebellion against David and attempts to murder him. Adonijah see, tries to seize the, the, the throne and try to take uh, one of David's, 
one of David's concubines and was executed. Sepatiah, he died young. Ephraim, he also died young. So, you know, had he listened to the principles of God's word, he would have been saved so much. And what this really speaks to me about is, is that, you know, it's like, I suppose what was going on in David's heart was this. He was looking around at the culture in which he lived in. And probably what he was saying was, sure, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. Every king has a harem. You know, every king takes many wives. And so, you know, he was justifying, I suppose, an indulgence by looking to the world as his, his measure. And, um, you know, and I want to say to you, because everybody is doing it, that is not a reason to break from God's principles. Amen. Or from God's life principles. The reason God puts principles in the scripture is to save us. He wants to make a, a fence at the top of the cliff. He doesn't want to be a, an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Amen. So the ways of God are pure and good and righteous and save us and protect us from much heartache. It's when we begin to try and, uh, you know, use cultural uh, understandings to uh, measure things by that we get ourselves into trouble. And so there was, I suppose in David's heart, there was a, a tug of war going on between the culture of the world and the culture of God's kingdom. And the question is, is who sets the standard? Who is setting the, the agenda? Is it just the fashion of the day or is it faith in God's word? And I tell you, friends, this is more relevant and pertinent today than in every, any other day. The word of God is being attacked. The principles of God are being attacked right, left, and center. And the, again, the same kind of, of um, strategy, the same kind of, of uh, justifications are used. Sure, we are more progressive. You know, we need to be, uh, you know, kind and, you know, things need to be relevant. Things, we need to be tolerant. And yet God often says, no, these things are harmful. Hallelujah. John MacArthur wrote a book entitled Thinking Right in a World That's Gone Wrong. Now, let me just say something about John MacArthur before I... One of the things we've got to learn to do is we need to take the meat and spit out the bones. Okay, John MacArthur is a marvelous Bible teacher on many subjects, but where it comes down to the Holy Spirit, <laughs> he's a disaster. Absolute disaster. Um, but uh, as I said, I, I, I enjoy reading his Bible teaching, uh, but I have to, to, to filter what he says because his understand, sometimes his understanding. But anyhow, praise God. So this is what he says. He says, our response to moral questions is not determined by politics, economics, personal preferences, popular opinion, or human reasoning. Instead, it grounded in what God has told us is true about ourselves and the world. God's word offers sanity, clarity, and hope. Hallelujah. And those are powerful words and powerful sentiments, and I would say amen to that. Praise God. So, you know, it's God himself. It's his word. It's his principles that should color our choices and direct our, our actions, amen? Not the fashion of the day, not what's trendy, not what is, you know, sentimentally, emotionally, uh, you know, uh, public, uh, politically correct to do, but that which is what God has called us to do. Praise God. And so now the, the narrative sort of shifts back to uh, the... The, the, the tensions between the house of Saul and the house of David. And we find here that Abner, this uh, commander of Saul's army, the one who's uh, propping up Ishaboth in Israel, uh, is accused of something, of inappropriate behavior with uh, Rizpah, the concubine. Verse 6, it says here, And there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David. Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. So he's, he's there, he's the power behind the throne. And now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa, the daughter of Aya. 
And Ishaboth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Wow. So this is something that, you know, just took Abner by surprise. This was a bolt out of the blue. He wasn't expecting it. And um, in those days, uh, it, again, they had, a lot of the kings had concubines. The concubines were often slaves or uh, seen as almost like a chattel. Um, and this would have been the case with Rizpah. Rizpah uh, is someone who is seemingly insignificant. She didn't have a lot of clouts in the royal household. As if she was a, a slave, a servant, a, a seen as, as, as almost like a, a, a chattel. Um, and yet, you know, we find that sometimes small things are the things that matter. Because she becomes the issue that would eventually bring down the house of Saul. See, Rizpah reveals the destructive power there is in rumor. Her name means hot coals or glowing. And some have suggested that's a reference to her, her beauty. Uh, they say she was, a, she was hot. <laughs> um, but others would say, no, it's, 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 a, um, um, uh, it's a reference to her kind disposition. In Proverbs chapter 25, it says this, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him drink to, water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Hallelujah. And so we find that, uh, you know, that, that that's a, a reference just to, to, being, to being kind. The idea of putting burning coals was uh, a practice where uh, fire would often go out. Uh, and, uh, you know, what would happen is, is they would uh, uh, gather the coals, they'd put it in an urn, and they would put it on their heads. And they would bring it home, and it would have fire for the next day. But if you were really, really kind, and say your neighbor's, coals were going out, you would actually give some of your coals to them. And so that was seen as a, an act of kindness. You didn't have to do that, but out of goodness, out of, uh, out of grace and uh, out of kindness, you gave it to them. Amen. So, um, and also Psalm 140 verse 10 says, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast in the fire into the miry pits, no more to rise. Let not the slander be established in the land. So the third aspect here is, is that of slander. And again, or gossip, or rumor. And uh, again, the Bible has a lot to say about these things. Let me just read to you one verse here from uh, Proverbs 26. It says, For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And when there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling for strife. The words of a whisper are like delicious morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of the body, like lays covering an earthen vessel, are fervent lips with an evil heart. So Abner is in charge. He is working hard. He is uh, doing his best, I suppose. And somewhere along the line, Ishaboth hears a rumor. He says, you know, Abner, you better watch him. Abner's just getting a little bit too big for his boots. And you know what? I heard the other day that he grabbed a hold of Rizpah. That's Saul's concubine. And he's taken her for himself. Whisper, 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 whisper. And that whisper finally finds its way to Ishaboth. Now, Ishaboth, as I said, is a, a ninny. He is a weak, stupid, inexperienced, weak willed, weak minded individual. And what we see here is, is the fact that he doesn't even bother to check it out, he just accepts it as fact. And uh, you see, the inference was serious. Inference for, some, for a, 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 a non-royal to take the royal's concubine was paramount to treason. And so what was being said here is, is that uh, Abner is making a play for the crown. And we see that again in verse 6, he was making himself strong in the house of Saul. And, and really what 
the least it would be that, that he would be taking a liberty of crossing a line. And so we find here that, that uh, you know, uh, he's just accepts it. But the effect on Abner is, is, is that Abner gets offended. Verse 8, it says, Abner was very angry over the words of Ishaboth. He says, am I a dog, dog's head of Judah? To this day I keep showing, I keep showing uh, steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends. And you've not given, uh, not given you into the hand of Saul. And yet you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman. God so do to Abner and also, uh, also more. If I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the house of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Hallelujah. And it finishes there. Verse 11 says, And Ishaboth could not answer another word because he feared him. So Abner really, when he, when he responds really in an offended and an angry fashion, is really putting Ishaboth in his place. Because what's happened, this is fake news. He has no facts with him. All he has is rumor. And again, we have to be very careful, uh, you know, with, you know, what is said around the body of Christ. You know, I sometimes get a bit annoyed and a bit bent out of shape, sometimes, uh, with these characters that I call watchdog Christians. You've got to be careful what you read in the media, you have to be careful what you read on uh, the internet uh, in regards to Christian ministry. Because, you know, the scripture says, says, do not accept an accusation against a leader, except at the mouths of two or three witnesses, and then let every fact be established. And so what this was, was really, it was fake news. Fake news about Abner. And uh, as I said, um, and of course, that, that's often power for the court, uh, for the course. Um, Luke chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, It is impossible that the defense has come, but woe to whom, but unto them through whom they come. Amen. So Abner's offended. Uh, and offense is now the second thing that brings down uh, the house of Saul. First was rumor. The second was Abner's response to that rumor. And so Abner goes out and he reaches out to David. And we read this in, in verses 12 to 16. It says, Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf saying, To whom does the lamb belong? And this is Abner reaching out to David. Who does the lamb belong? Make a covenant with me. And behold, my hand shall be with you to bring all over all of Israel to you. And David replies and he says, good, I'll make a covenant with you. But one thing I require is that before you see, one thing I require of you, that is that you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, and when you, when you come to see my face. And then David sent messengers to Ishaboth, Saul's son, saying, give me my wife, Michael, for whom I paid a bridal price of a hundred foreskins from the Philistines. And Ishaboth sent and took her from her husband, Patiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went, weeping, went with her, weeping after her all the way to Barum. And then Abner said to him, go return, and he returned. As I said, you know, Abner had been Saul's trusted military commander, a seasoned war horse, no-nonsense kind of individual, uh, commanded respect from both friend and foe. And he had been the one who had also, but he'd also been the one that had hunted David. Now, this is testimony to David's character. David, the fact that David entertained Abner and would entertain a meeting with Abner reveals something about the character and nature where, where, where David was at. See, David had come into a place where he trusted that God would fulfill that which he had said. The work that he'd begun in him, he would complete. The promise that he'd given to him would be, you know, ultimately would come to fruition. God would be faithful to his promise to David. David just had to cooperate and flow with God. He had to trust God, that God knew what he was doing. It also says something about David's character. You know, he was a man of personal security. 
He was comfortable in his own skin. We contrast that with Saul, who was constantly, you know, trying to perform, constantly sort of trying to, uh, you know, compare himself with, with other people. Uh, very, he was a, a people pleaser. And um, so David was, was secure. He'd come to a place where, you know, uh, he was willing to, uh, to wait on God. God was the one who was going to, to bring the promises to pass. And he also was willing to exercise forgiveness and faith in relation to a, a foe. And, you know, that's, there's something about, you know, strong leaders who are able to uh, forgive those who've opposed them in the past. You know, some people, when they get opposed by somebody, it's like they hold on to that. Says, I'm not going to forget, I'm not going to forget that. I'm never going to trust you again, you know. Uh, and they make those inner vows. And when they make those inner vows, what they're actually doing is, is they're establishing themselves as Lord and Savior. They're in control. We've got to be very careful about the, the things that we speak to ourselves in, okay. Uh, inner vows are things we need to repent of. We never say, I will never. I will never do this and I will never do that. Don't make those kind of vows. They're dangerous because they will block you and keep you stuck in a moment. That moment will travel with you the rest of your life. David didn't do that. Now, as I said, Abner has been the one who had been chasing him all those, all those seven years in the wilderness. Uh, he knew Abner. Abner knew him. And yet there was this mutual respect between Abner and David. Uh, you know, as I said, he was a no-nonsense individual. And so when he was coming to him, he realized that, you know, this, was, this wasn't a, a political play. He wasn't that kind of man. He was a black and white uh, kind of individual. And David was willing to forgive him, to entertain a reconciliation with him. But before that, he says, we see this, this thing, statement here. He, says, he wanted a restoration of his wife, Michael. Now, you remember back that one of the things that Saul did was he gave Michael uh, as, a, um, uh, as the wife of David. David it was David's first wife. And um, then he changed his mind. Can you imagine that? You know, you're married happily, enjoying life, got your future ahead of you. And then all of a sudden, you know, somebody from uh, above, some, some authority figure comes and says, I'm sorry, uh, you've got to give her back. And that just humiliated David. It, it, it hurt him. Uh, and so he wanted that restored. And um, in some ways, it could also have been a situation where uh, he would also, by having Michael, it would be a, a greater claim to Saul's throne. He didn't need a, another wife, by the way. He'd already had enough. But uh, So there was a, probably a reason on this one. But I, I imagine here now, we also see here that it was pretty tough on, on uh, uh, Michael's current husband, Patil. And we see that Patil, when... Uh, also very interesting, is as David speaks to Abner, he says, I want Michael. And then he goes to the king of Israel and says, by the way, I want her back. And Ishboth, again, the sickly ninny, he, he just says, okay. <laughs> and he takes the wife, Michael, and, and, and so Patiel, he's heartbroken. He starts running after his wife. And Abner, he just turns around and he says, go home. It's, it's like, you know, this is the, the toughness of, of Abner. And um, so he goes home. And Abner, uh, here in uh, verse 17, he rallies support for David amongst the other tribes. And verse 17, he says, Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, for some time past, you've been seeking David as king uh, over you. Now then bring it about. For the Lord has promised David saying, by the hand of my servant David, will I save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines, from the hand of all their enemies. So Abner spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole household of Benjamin thought good to do. Now the first thing we recognize here in these, in these verses is this. 
Abner knew all along. He knew that David was the anointed king. All the days that he was chasing him, he knew that God had anointed him king. All these years at Hebron, he knew that David was the anointed king. And he declares that. He says, the Lord has promised David. Which tells something about Joab. Joab, or, uh, not Joab, sorry, Abner. Abner speaks to the elders of Israel. That's the northern tribes. And he also speaks to Benjamin. He speaks to Benjamin particularly singles them out because they're the tribe of Saul. And so he needs to get them all on board in order to make this happen. And um, it's significant that the word came from Abner and not from David, uh, though he was the rightful king. And see, David was not prepared to uh, make things happen for himself unless the people themselves were willing to freely submit to him. And really, this was a, a step in that direction. But here's what I want to just take out of this. This illustration really speaks of the lordship of Christ in our lives. The fact is, is he is king of kings and lord of lords. Hallelujah. But he chooses for the foremost, for most part, to exercise his sovereignty over our lives only with our own cooperation. There are very few times God will twist your arm. He will come to you gently. He'll come to you lovingly. He will invite you to respond to him in grace and in love. Hallelujah. But we find that many people don't invite Christ to rule over their, anything in their lives. Some invite Christ only to reign over some of their lives, a small area of life, just like Hebron. Hebron was only part of Israel, and David was only king over Hebron. Some give Jesus reign over everything and authority over every area of their life, over everything. Praise God. And they're the ones who are most blessed. So Abner here is, a, is an example, if you like, of somebody who will eventually surrender. He's on a journey to surrender. And now he just wants to influence others to surrender the king, to God's kingship. And in verse 18, there's a key verse. He says, he says, now then, bring it about, for the Lord has promised David. Now there was a, a famous preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon. And uh, he shared a, a message called, Now then, do it. Or we could say, Now then, bring it about. And in this message, uh, he, shows the, he shows how the same principles of, Israel, of Israel's embrace of David as king it colors or it uh, reflects our relationship with Christ. And he says this. He says, The Israelites might talk about making King David king, but that would not crown him. They might meet together and say they wished it were so, but that would not do it. It might be generally admitted that he ought to be the monarch, and might have even been, they might have even earnestly hoped that one day we, he would be so, but that wouldn't do it. No, something more needed to be decided. Something must be done. Hallelujah. And you see, Sometimes Christians know the will of God. They know what God is saying. They've heard it time and time and time and time and time again. And they say, well, one day, one day I'll pray. One day I'll submit. One day I'll obey. One day I'll let you deal with that area of my life. One day, one day, one day. They think it's a grand idea. They know it conceptually. One day, one day, one day. One day I'll talk to my neighbor. One day I'll listen to the announcements. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to bring somebody to the carol service. <laughs> Peter says it week after week. <laughs> one day, 
One day, one day, one day. And that is one of our biggest issues in the Western world. We take our time to obey. We come at our own pace, we come in our own way, and we don't obey. We struggle with obedience. You know, and yet we know God is speaking to us. Hallelujah. Now, for some people, you know, they're willing to obey immediately. God, you've said it, I believe it, I'm going to do it. Other people, they make excuses. They sure, well, you know, it's going to cost me this, and it's going to cost me that. Um, you know, people are going to get upset, and, you know, it's going to mess up my, my plans. And we go round, and round, and round that mountain. Look at the children of Israel. Forty years they spent in the wilderness until they finally came to that place where they were willing to obey God. Hallelujah. The scripture says, today is a day of your salvation. There are people who've heard the gospel over and over and over again. And yet, they defer it. They put it off. And put it off another day. Joshua 24 says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Well, you're going to serve the gods of the Amorites or you're going to serve the living God. Hallelujah. Elijah on Mount Carmel stood and he challenged the prophets of Baal. He said, listen, he said, that the true God answer by fire. Choose you. How, many, how long is it going to be where you hold between two opinions? If God is God, if he really is who he says he is, then serve him. Serve him. Give your life to him. Allow him in. Or if Baal be God, then serve him. And sometimes we need that message, friends, because we're sometimes half in and half out. And we wonder why we're not getting the victory or the favor that God wants. That's because we've made a decision. Hallelujah. Abner knew. Abner knew all along that David was the anointed king. And it took Mizpah, Arispah, Saul's concubine, to bring him to his senses. It took an offense to bring him to his, to his senses. Hallelujah. Praise God. So true to his word, Abner goes, and I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, he goes to David, and, he, um, and David welcomes him uh, with a feast. And, and uh, I won't read it here. You can check this out, uh, verses 20 to 21. And, um, and so, you know, there's an agreement that, uh, you know, Abner is going to get all the, the tribes. He speaks to the tribes um, and uh, brings them on board. And then... David sends him away in peace. Abner has, or, uh, sorry, yeah, Abner has come. They've made the, 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 the agreed the covenant and to make a covenant uh, at that feast, and uh, and and he says these things. He's, David says uh, he basically says that, da that he tells to da David, Abner wanted David to reign as as much as his heart desires. Hallelujah. So he wants David to have a, a full. Uh, reign in, uh, in Israel. But then what happens is there's a spanner in the works. And sometimes, you know, when there's a good plan being hatched, when God is beginning to open up some doors, sometimes someone comes and tries to put a spanner in the works. Every good plan is tested. And now we find David's uh, commander, the commander of the armies of David, his name is Joab. And you remember back that there was an incident between Joab and Abner, and uh, they had a fight uh, and, uh, between the house of Saul and the house of David. And um, at one point, uh, Joab's brother, Ashiel, Ashiel was a, a sprinter, a triathlete, if you like. 
And he starts running after Abner, the seasoned war horse that he was. And Abner says to him, is that you, Ashiel? And Ashiel says, yes. He says, now go back home. Leave me alone. I don't want to hurt you. Leave me alone. Go back. And Ashiel hasn't even bothered to get a sword or a, uh, any, any, any armaments. He's, he's just running after him. And three times Job tells him to go back. And eventually, you know, Ashiel catches up with him. And maybe in a, in a fit of just uh, self-protection, Joab takes the, the back of his spear and he just rams it and it hits Ashiel. And Ashiel dies. And Job and his brother haven't forgotten that. And so David is met with, with, with Abner. Uh, they've made a covenant. He's going off to gather Israel to make this, to formalize this. And Joab sends out word to, sorry, Abner sends out word to Joab, come here, I've, I've got something to tell you. And so Abner comes back to Hebron, and they meet at the gate. And it says here that uh, uh, then Abner returned to Hebron, Job took him aside in the midst of the gate to speak to him privately. And there he struck him in the stomach, so he died for the, for the blood of Ashiel, his brother. So suddenly, you know, it's like their chief negotiator has been murdered by one of, jo by one of David's key individuals. And this throws everything up in the air. Now, because Joab... Would just, could justify this saying, well, listen, I was only doing this to protect David, to honor my king David. But really, you know, he's playing around. He knows rightly that he's overstepped the mark. They, he, Joab has taken a liberty. He's gone beyond his remit. He's acted rationally. And when people act rationally, when they take matters into their own hands, when they take those liberties, they often mess up things big time. I was just thinking here, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 says this. This is Paul. Paul says, We will not boast beyond the limits, but we will boast only in regards to the area of influence that God has assigned to us to reach even you. Hallelujah. So there's the Apostle Paul. Paul knew where his influence, his sphere of influence, his sphere of authority began and ended. And what he's saying, he's saying this. In certain situations, in certain places, I know what my authority is. I can speak to you in a way that is uh, you know, God-anointed and God-ordained. But in another setting, in another man's area of anointing or area of authority, I know my place. I know when it's right for me to speak. And I know when it's right for me not to speak. I know when it's right for me to act and respond and when it's not. And a lot of people in the body of Christ do not understand that. You have people who just willy-nilly say what they want to say. And they say, it's my rights. It's my rights to speak my mind. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. No, you don't. You don't have a right to do that at all. You see, rights, when you use the word right, I was thinking about this the other day. When you say right, a right to do something, that suggests that there's legitimacy. That means there's some rightness in that right. It's based upon some truth. You have the capacity. It's different. Everyone has got the capacity or the choice just a mouth off to vent. But not the right. There's a subtle difference. And if you belong to Christ, we've given up our rights. We've surrendered our rights to Him. We've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So friends, God has some order in His kingdom. There are spheres of authority, spheres of... of um, of influence. Every person has a sphere of grace and anointing. Hallelujah. And while you operate in that sphere of grace and anointing, God's blessing is upon you. 
The favor of God is upon you. Hallelujah. The effectiveness, the fruit is upon you. Hallelujah. But when we take a liberty, hallelujah, and we step over that line and into somebody else's place of authority and anointing and grace, then we're in trouble. Then we mess things up. And that's what Joab did here. He potentially could have messed this whole scenario up. Hallelujah. And just, again, in conclusion, we find David. David has to distance himself from, from Joab, his own commander. And uh, he basically says, look, you know, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord of the blood of Abner, son of Ner. May it fall upon the head of Joab, upon his father's house. And he goes into this whole thing where he almost like says a curse upon the house of, of Joab. And then he has to do something else. He leads the morning, uh, in the morning of, for Abner. He lifts up his voice. He weeps at the grave of, Ab of, Ab of Abner. And Israel comes to understand that it wasn't David's will. It wasn't David's heart to do Abner harm. And so that leads them to a position where they are able to fulfill the promise. And we're going to see uh, next week... David now is moving into his final phase, his final season of his life, and that is as king of Israel. Hallelujah. So let's just pray. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord my God, that you are training us, Lord my God, to be kings and priests unto our God. Lord, we're not just church members. We're not just Christians, but you decree and declare over us that we are kings and priests, people who worship you, people who have authority and who are called to rule and reign. And Father God, I thank you, Lord, that that's no easy task. Lord, you are working in our hearts to produce something, Lord, that is worthy of you. And so, Father, we pray today, Lord, Lord, allow your words to work in us. Lord, those things, oh God, you're calling us to do, we're not going to put off. We declare that you are the Lord and King of our hearts. And Lord, my God, I pray, Lord, that we will not, Lord, overstep the mark. But we'll operate within that sphere, Lord, that you've given us. Hallelujah. Lord, we won't be, Lord, those, Lord, that are swayed by rumor or offense. But Lord, my God, we will be those, O oh God, who are secure in the knowledge, Lord, that you will complete the work that you've started in us. Lord, my God, touch our hearts. Go deep into our hearts, O oh God. Work in our hearts. Have your way in our hearts, O oh God. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys.